brief message from your friendly neighborhood editing Jordan. We tend to try to keep things pretty PG-13 around here, but this is an improv podcast. So who knows what we're going to say. Sometimes we throw in some swearing, some sexual content, and some violence. So as a general warning, viewer discretion is advised. Also to be noted, the opinions stated about a certain tabletop role-playing game are just that, our opinions. We love the game and we like talking about it. So any criticisms are really just all in good fun. That being said, wizards, please hire us. All right, with that out of the way, let's get on with the show. And so the battle was over and the day is won. Hello, everybody. My name is Markiplier, and today we are ending <laughs> campaign War for Olympus with the Nat One Podcast D&D group. This has been an amazing campaign, and I'm so glad that it's finally coming to an end. I, I, I can't. I can't. It, yeah, live more than that. What are you still doing here? Campaign's Movie's over. Over. Go home. Go on. Find Deadpool. That's not a Deadpool reference. That's a, That's Ferris, a Ferris Bueller, Bueller reference. Deadpool does it though in his movie. But he, it's, it's a, a, Ferris it's a reference to Ferris Bueller. I know. I know it's a reference. He Gen directly Alpha. parodies the movie. <laughs> That's why I said it in the first place. Oh, goo goo gaga, skibbity toilet, skibbity toilet. <laughs> we all do that as much to him as we probably could. You're younger. I want to hear uh, it from younger. you. Uh, <laughs> iPad kid. <laughs> oh. All right. Thankfully, there's nothing either of you can tease me on collectively. So. You really you want to put money on that? Let's just roll the intro. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to the Nat One Podcast, aka Nope, because nope, you're not going to want to hear what we're about to have to say. I'm Pertusa. I'm Levi. And I'm Jordan. I stay winning. I stay on top because I play both sides. <laughs> <laughs> because Today, of the implications. Everybody. Today, everybody, <laughs> we are talking about D&D for once. As we do about oh. once a month on our D and D podcast. Our D and D podcast. We're pretty good about it this year. We've been yeah. Now the memes right. kind of, almost kind of getting old because we've been doing actually kind of a good job about it. I want to talk about anime again. It's been a minute, but we do have D and D news coming down the pipeline though, so we may be stuck on D and D for a little bit longer. True. Oh, True. Really not. But yeah, we. This is kind of a kind of a special episode, kind of not. It's just because it lined up with real world stuff that we're doing our home game one of our home games one of our home game campaigns is about to wrap up we are only probably we are less than probably less than five sessions away from the end i thought we were like significantly three sessions, less than yeah. sessions away <laughs> yeah uh, I'm, ju I'm just guesstimating based off of I, I feel like five is the absolute maximum we could go at if worst came to worst and we dragged out for as long as possible true we did say this campaign was gonna end a year ago we did we did say that <laughs> so yeah no we are bringing it to a close and we thought that it would be a, a good you know thing to kind of talk about in the podcast is if you're a dm you know, how should you go about ending your campaign and things of that general nature as well, things in and surrounding the end of campaigns? We're the authorities on it. We are. Yep. We've as, ended three whole campaigns as of the end of this one. As we've explained in our videos uh, going over Unearthed Arcana for D 1D&D, &D, we are very clearly the utmost authority figures on D&D. &D. Um, and only like 358 people know it as of right now, but soon it's, it's 362. It went it up is? today. Yes. Well, there you go. See, see moving up in the world. Everyone will know every voice shall cry, but yeah. So, I mean, Pertusa is the DM for this campaign. So he looks like somebody's holding a gun to his head. This I'm, if you hold that face for long enough, I'm going to make it another emoji in our Do Discord it. channel. Wait. Can, He's asking for it. I'm getting snipping tool. <laughs> oh, gosh. I got it. I got it. All right. I should have stared at the camera when I did that. Well. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, just, like, kill all your players, and then you don't have to play anymore. So, end of campaign You're right there. You're so true for this. You're <laughs> 
That's the easy way. That's what we thought was going to happen. Do the lame way and make them play through 1 through 20 levels, which I got to do some quick math quickly because I'm pretty sure I I messed up and you're a, a level behind. So, <laughs> uh, uh-oh. Hopefully I think get we to 1 bri- to 20. <laughs> I think we briefly had a conversation about that, actually, after the last session where we were like, oh, I guess we're going to be level 20 after we fight the big bad. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what happened there, but uh, well, I'll figure it out. Don't worry. I'll just uh, have someone else fight you in the middle. <laughs> we can just do the other <laughs> boss fight that we have. There you go. Yeah, we can go dip into the other door. I don't want to. I... <laughs> I'm Please scared of her. Make me. <laughs> so, my personal philosophy on if you're going to do a level 1 through 20 campaign is that narratively, the threat should grow over the course of the campaign from something small and meager like a a local serial killer for example to something like a renowned soldier or wizard and then to something like a world ending threat and then finally to something like a universe ending threat i like that progression because most level 1 to 20 characters get world ending capabilities themselves so what better way to challenge them by than with something that is universe ending at the very end and it's a group of people, too. So, you know, it's not one world-ending person all by themselves. So, and I think that that was executed decently well on my part in this. The main villain never changed, but as far as the escalation of your threats, I think it followed that more or less to a T. Yeah, no, honestly, um, I think kind of in a... I don't think it was narratively intended, but kind of in a funny way, almost, we have seen um the separate threats that we've encountered over the course of the entire story all come back at the very end because we had several almost like kind of different antagonists who were what we were mainly focused on at different points in the story but i'm thinking of um in our last session we had a boss fight which was against an antagonist who we had fought a couple times over the course of the story and honestly mm-hmm. we were probably more um invested with that antagonist for like a good middle chunk of the campaign than we have been with the bbg just because we haven't gotten as much time with the with the bbg at the very end because they are a world if not technically universe ending threat i just think the universe of hesiod is quite small um <laughs> um but yeah no so like we f- saw them at this confrontation that was happening very close to the end of the campaign and all of us like knew that this was it we were gonna and also they did almost kill us too but he shot um, me (laughs) they were very they were very tough um but at the same time like we defeated that person and even though they weren't the bbg I think we all felt a sigh of relief after we were done because we were like it's finally over (laughs) they're gone we can get on to the rest of it now. Like, hey, you forgot to cut his head off again. We can't be sure that he's really gone. <laughs> Don't tell me that. No. <laughs> he comes back as we're coming down uh, the steps of Olympus. Uh, uh, <laughs> juice make a cestus. <laughs> he's an ooze now. He's he an learned an... to control oh, it. He's an oobleck. <laughs> yeah, ew. But yeah. So. I don't know, though. I was a little stuck for a long time figuring out, like, I knew who the villain was going to be. The villain was going to be Ares. But, man, I was like, what's going to make him so special, huh? What's going to make him stronger than the rest of the people? And thankfully, it was something that the players never technically had at once, so I didn't have to quantify what it was. (laughs) It's just the he gets to win button as far as they're concerned. Yeah. And it works. Hmm. so oh. that's all you need sometimes your players don't need access to everything i thought they did for a time i thought everything i made needed to have something that you could quantifiably see in a stat block or a, an item description uh but no instead i will simply lie uh <laughs> or or withhold information and they will be none the wiser it's all okay and that is how you know your journey as a dm is complete you're <laughs> you have reached the end and i now can lie to my players your apotheosis is complete and the apotheosis is upon us 
No, it's not a pawn. It's gone. Mm -hmm. It's done. It happened. I just want to quote the guy who didn't like musicals. Now, I cannot fully reveal because we have yet to fight the final boss how it's going to go down. But I personally am very proud with my final fight. Now, haven't done a whole lot of other final fights, especially not like official content. So I can't compare much to official content. But I really like how my final fight's going to go because it is final. It is the epitome of finality which sounds like a, a genshin banner um, it does <laughs> but that is these guys the will path see... in honkai star rail oh yeah finality these guys will see when they get to it but my point is is it was all building to this and depending on what happens in the end the campaign's gonna be over one way or the other and that's and this is this is where it all comes down to yeah <laughs> We're either going to die or something else is going to happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or they're going to die. And if then... we die, we don't have to worry about it anymore. True, it's out True. of our hands. Bomb the Lhasa moment. will save us. <laughs> it's going to be good. It's going to be the culmination of all things that have happened over the course of the campaign. From everything small to everything large, it's all going to culminate in one moment. One thing that will probably account for like a minute in their actual world time. If that. But it will take us seven hours. <laughs> yeah. Probably. So that's I how you should end your D D campaign. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> how you should 20. end it. Make it culmination of every single thing you've ever done. Not exactly. just in D D, but your entire life. No. Correct. Involve uh, everything ever. Aren't we really just in a one to twenty campaign in life? No. <laughs> I am beyond that. We're if all beyond that. Well, if that's the case, my is players age your really level. Is... I assumed. Is it not? I thought I it was skill think set. That it would be no. Please don't tell me it's my bank account. <laughs> I think it's, it's skill so set, and my player po- rolled really, really poorly. <laughs> it's your teeth. Oh. Huh. <laughs> you I get more as you do. get older. Dang it! I'm about to have some of them yanked out. You do not get more as you get older. Technically, you do. Very briefly. I was going to say, not when you get really older. Some people get to keep theirs. There is an instance where you gain more levels, and then like a PC in D&D, as you get old, you probably lose some of your levels, because you're getting old. Well, no, as you age, your teeth continue to come in, and like baby teeth and stuff, so you do gain teeth. Well, yeah, but you get old and they fall out because you're old. Sharks are so strong. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sharks yes. are actively g- regenerating levels. Oh, my gosh. Shark BBG. Shark Babeg. Babeg. He just, that, okay, I know you weren't, <laughs> I know the audience can't see, but he just looked behind him really quick and it, because he said that it made it look like he was looking for a shark. Right behind him. I was, and there is one. <laughs> yeah. But that's all there is. <laughs> oh, I also have one of these things over here, but it doesn't regenerate teeth. Dang. We don't know that. We don't know that. That's true. I'm getting another one soon. So it has a friend? It has a friend. Sorry, so it has a twin. There you go. Dang. They're besties. They are. Look, they're both smiling. <laughs> they're going to kill everybody. Family photo. They will wipe out the human race. Well, Ganyu's uh, not on that level that Makima is, I'd say. Oh, but I'm regardless. talking about Pertuz it. <laughs> oh. Um, no, he already did that. Well, he didn't wipe him out, but he got pretty close. He tried. Um, huh? He still can. What? He pro- yeah, he, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, from a player's perspective, because I, we've, we've mentioned it a couple times back in the backlog of podcast episodes that we have, but I was the DM for this group for the first two campaigns we played, which collectively took like, I want to say three years or was it three or four? Um, for what? The first two campaigns, Vivia 1 and Vivia 2. The first two in total playtime took about two years. No, a year total. Really? Not like 
start date of Vivio one to end date of Vivio one. No, I play time was. I, okay. Oh, okay, 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 okay. It was like six months each. Um, I don't know. We did log a whole bunch of hours for Vivio one when we played for a week straight. If yeah, depending yeah. on your hour count, it'd be different. <laughs> Because we did a week straight of like 13 hour sessions that one time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So for that entire time, I I had never really experienced like, you know, this is it. This is the end is coming up and you got to be mentally prepared for it. And I mean, I think it's a, a different animal when you because I don't I honestly I would be interested to see um, like if someone somehow could statistically like find out how many D and D players do one to 20 as like their main thing. Or, or if it's more like, Oh, we do like one to 10 or we'll do like one to seven and then we're done. Or we do like adventures and then we're done. We don't do big long form campaigns. I want to know if we're in the majority or the minority, but we've only I, ever done that. <laughs> I think we're in the minority simply because I know there are a lot of stories of people starting what they expected to be a one to 20 campaign and they don't, like the group does not make it to level mm -hmm. 20. Yeah. I don't know. Which is sad. Uh, but the reason I'm getting at that is because I started to say earlier, I think it's a different animal when you're doing one to 20 um, because your character goes from the, the basest of the base, which is just barely stronger than a commoner to you are a demigod basically uh, <laughs> at the end of the campaign. Um, and it gives you so much time to do, I mean, we're, again, we've also said this several times, but we're a pretty RP heavy group. Although I think um, more recently we have been attracted a little bit to the mechanical side of D&D &D just because of the mess that is one D&D. &D. Uh, <laughs> we've almost been foisted into a role of being like, how does the game actually work? <laughs> How are we right and Wizards yeah. is incorrect of how to run their own game? Um, but we've always enjoyed the RP side of it. And we have told really interesting stories with these characters. And in a few weeks, that's it. I mean, there will probably be more generally, because I know even we with old characters from the campaigns <laughs> I've DM'd every once in a while, we'll bring up stuff like oh, did this happen after the campaign? And then we'll talk about it and I'll be like, that's probably what ended up happening. But we don't, we're not those characters anymore. We don't act as them. We don't play as them. We don't interact with other people. That's just determining lore after, after the fact. So like, it's almost upon us that I'm not going to be Zamda anymore. And it's going to be melancholic, I think, because I'm going to, well, depending on how it ends if she doesn't if she dies i will be very sad probably if she dies it's that's the um, worst case scenario if any of us dies. die at, at this point that's the worst case scenario because we've all been together for quite a bit of time i don't um, i i told you earlier if zamda dies arlo's gonna nuke the world yeah <laughs> if if you survive as well to even be able True, to do that that's assuming if they both die honestly that's a little bit poetic i will be very upset but it'll be poetic if if one dies, especially if Zamda dies and Arlo is left, Arlo is going to do very irresponsible things. And that's even saying if there's a world to be irresponsible and after the fact. We, it's been True. hinted at several times. I mean, we have no idea what's going to happen, but it's been hinted at several times by our DM that the world is going to be irre irrevocably changed after the end of the campaign. So we do not know what lies beyond the veil. And I think having a little bit of that mystery also, you know, helps us to want to make that final push as well. Mm -hmm. Again, all these things culminating together. What lies beyond? What is in store for our characters after everything we've done together? After most of us have gone 1 to 20 together? What lies on the other side of this story? What is at the end? Um, well, funny you should mention it. No, no, I'm not. Tell me, no, no, no. I'm not. tell me, tell me, tell no. me. I won't tell Levi. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'll cut off my ears so I can't hear you. <laughs> Yo, um, he's Van Gogh. Take it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Where? Well, what was I talking about? What? Uh, uh, ending level twenty as a character, going from one to twenty. It's storytelling. Yeah. yeah. So. I'm happy that I've got this group and I, I know 
like you said, Jordan, it's probably not the norm. But I ho- I hope that at least once anyone who their hobby is D&D and they play it pretty regularly, they get to experience a 1 to 20 campaign. Because yeah. I feel like it just gives you the narrative room to really do something special and create a story with your friends that you you won't forget. That's it. I I kind of ended abruptly, but that's it. <laughs> yeah. I use my D and D character names as my password for stuff. I hold all of the lore for all of the D and D worlds that we've played in in my brain at all times. I every time Jordan brings that up, it makes me think of the meme of the guy being like. Oh hi, my name's Jonathan, and then the name goes into the brain, and there's no space, and it just like flits out, and he goes, "Hi, hey, George. Yeah, <laughs> hi, George. Do you want to know about blank, blank, blank?" That's that's interacting with me in real life. Hi, George. You want to hear about me and my friends' D and D campaigns? Yeah, <laughs> just all the information in Jordan's head is D and D lore from mine and Pertusit's homebrew worlds, and nothing else. It sounds like a joke, but we have these discussions late at night in the Discord, and we're talking about how something happened in one of the campaigns and there would be like a general recount of events and I'll be like yeah no that was called this and somebody died and then Taryn got swallowed and I'm sitting here like why do I know this yep. which I know again like you said we joke about it but I think that plays back into the like these are memorable things that we've done together as friends and so it actually does like help us remember those things because we're having fun and we're, even mm-hmm. in the times when we're not having fun when we're getting our butts handed to us by a combat encounter we are still having fun it's just not in not in the conventional way we will we're masochists. It. it will be an experience that will stay with us i'll never forget the mecha cestus fight <laughs> no <laughs> Especially I not I died after for a solid went, I just want to interject and tell everyone that this guy can instantly kill you and you can't be revived except for with wish. Oh. Context in the middle of the fight that we had this week, my character had been uh, knocked unconscious and the enemy had come right up close to us and Pertuzit had posted a gif in the Discord of like the action, one of the actions that he could use from I. I want to say it's League of Legends. Uh, and in the middle of a turn, Producer just goes, I'd like to remind everybody, if you reference the GIF in the Discord, he can do that. And everybody just kind of stops because it happens to an unconscious player. And I was the only player unconscious at we the moment. All, so like, for a solid five seconds, everybody thought I was dead. We all misunderstood for two <laughs> and thought that he had just killed jordan's character and all and like just was like all right let's move on to the next thing <laughs> and all of us were like uh okay we're... i was simply trying to tell them that if they don't act quickly that's what was going to happen i <laughs> stopped breathing thankfully we avoided it though yeah we're all still kicking for now mm-hmm. um but yeah no for now And that's something to reflect upon, I think, is um, I, having been the sole DM for like two years, roughly, um, or one year, or however, whatever whatever that calculation was, I only had like in my head how things should work based off of my perceptions as DM. And I think it's been a really, I think it's been a fantastic experience being a player in another DMs campaign going all the way from one to 20, because now I can kind of judge based off of the work of someone else. Like, oh, I, as a player really enjoyed this thing. So I know that that is probably something I should try to incorporate again or something like that. It really helps to see things from both sides of the table. Um, and Again, one to 20 experience gives you that time, gives you all these different situations that occur over the course of the story, lets you see something that might happen at level five that you might not enjoy at level 15 because maybe then it's not a challenge at all. But then also here's this other thing that happens at level 15 that you probably wouldn't have enjoyed at level five because maybe your character didn't have the skill set to do it then. And so not only has it been great as an exercise of of friendship 
but it's been great as a way for me to also be like, I want to do some of these things that Pertusit has done in my campaign, which I'm DMing next. I've been talking a lot. And I've also been seeing that Pertusit's been making faces, but I've been trying not to look at the computer okay. screen. <laughs> All right. That's why That's I was what listening, mean. but he kept making me laugh, so I had to mute. <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm I'm done now. I'm off my soapbox. I'm gonna... I was trying to break him by making funny faces. You broke me. <laughs> you kept you kept looking away. I was waiting I'm for him. Looking, his I vision keep looking to go. up at my picture of uh, Artoria and Mordred over here, just admiring their oh. fight in order to keep away from you. I can see it out of the corner of my eye. I can see your face moving. And I know you're doing something. True. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what else more to add on from my DM perspective. Um, I already mentioned I'm a big fan of like a final ending. If you're doing a one to twenty campaign, I really like it being the end. For, I don't know if I want it to be the end of the world, but I like it being yeah. the end for the characters. Yeah, what Jordan said, but. I can, at the very least, I can absolutely attest that uh, if not Jordan, everybody does not let go of the events of the 1 to 20 campaign. <laughs> they are constantly living in their fantasy fulfillment world. Just the other night, I'd be taking a dump <laughs> because my stomach hurty, and I get a text that's like, hey, how did your character want to die? How did your oh, character yeah, that get was a grave? My me and i'm like most more things. i'm sitting here like <laughs> dylan got so excited when he saw your response good <laughs> well, I, I hit him with the uh, you know it's levi's decision but here's just what he would have said well we asked i asked levi and he said ask for two zits <laughs> yeah i said well ask that would father. be a and <laughs> that would be a question she said how did Victor like die or get put in a grave? And I said that is a question for Victor. Yeah, I was like, right? did, did Victor have an actual gravestone? Because I know that Victor wanted to be forgotten and just like not exist in the history of the world. I was like, okay, did he still have a grave marker of any kind, even if it didn't have the right name on it? Because in my in Atlas's epilogue, it stated that Atlas tends to the graves of everybody in the adventuring party, but I didn't know if Victor had a grave to yep. tend to. Which was the root of the question. And now, since you weren't, since you didn't get the rundown for Tuesday because you weren't actually there, it's oh, both. Boy. You got the one you wanted, which is where Victor's actually buried, which is an undescript grave. And there's a red herring grave, which is the, like, the super tomb of Victor that has all the, this is adventurers come here and find all these cool magical things that this ain't this super powerful leader of this mysterious organization left behind. And it serves a dual purpose because it's the vault that you kept all of the dangerous things in, but they're all incorporated into traps to kill people Good, <laughs> trying to come to get them. That's the point. Yes, that's it. If you want the power, you best learn how to take it. Yeah. <laughs> Physically, so, yeah. I mean. And like you just said, produce it that this five minute conversation we've had is a great example of these things never leave us. These <laughs> No. Especially are, since I write about them a lot. Yeah. We constantly have them in our heads. We, after we finished our last session of Pertusit's campaign, we stayed in the Discord after Pertusit got off because he he was like, I gotta go work tomorrow like a loser. Am I right? No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. no like a sane person we were in there until 5 a.m true yeah that's what i was oh, about to say easy. is we stayed up very late the rest of us and just discussed stuff about my homebrew Thanks. world and and also produce its homebrew world a lot of it was us being like oh what do you think's gonna happen what do you think the final boss is gonna be like how do you think because we're all expecting there to be some kind of trickery going mm -hmm. on some kind of gimmickry going on in the final boss fight so we're all talking about what do we think is going to happen there blah 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 and then obviously when pertusit ends his campaign we've got a um what's it called when parents are divorced and the kids go between parents joint custody we have joint custody of the D, &D group and so <laughs> when one dm is done with their campaign oh. we switch to the other one so yeah why don't parents do that more often where you just give the kid for three years and then swap over Honestly, I feel like that's the best case solution. It works well uh, for none us. Of us, none of us should have any say in this. We <laughs> all have parents that are happily married. It's we, true. 
<laughs> It'd be fun to try, though. <laughs> Get, like an island of people and see what happens. Can we, not one as a corporation, adopt a child and try Merge. this out? Everybody gets Oh, a turn. no, the Terran year. <laughs> Oh, that's a book. That's a book waiting to be written. <laughs> it's up to us to determine whether or not it's a fiction or an autobiography. Jokes on us. The Terran years are actually the ones that make them the most well adjusted. <laughs> Somehow, the survival Terran, of the fittest. No, Terran yeah. has like a neutralizing effect. <laughs> oh yeah, Terran is the the great equalizer from all of our different <laughs> rest parental of us. styles. Yes, you know what they say because he great doesn't... equalizer is the death. Sorry, we're not there yet. Your kids are going to love not, it. Your kid, you, yeah, you, our kids are going <laughs> to love it because we're going to have kids by the time we get there. Oh, man. But yeah, otherwise, man, uh, let's get into the mechanics of it and the minutia of it a little bit here. Okay. First off, level 20 characters, very, very strong. Multi-class or not, usually very, very strong. Mm, all the casters are going to have, if, if they were just casters, Ninth level spells, very, very strong, like Wish. Which has some limitations, but still. And sure, sure, sure. Paladins, you know, they got their big thing where they go beast mode for like uh, a minute. Some of them are better than others. Some of them just complete doo-doo fart. Like <laughs> sorcerers and bards. And yeah. I think monks as well. Get all your sorcery points back. <laughs> Not even all. Not, Not even all. all. I'm pretty sure it's like four. <laughs> um, That's so bad. Yes. Uh... And sure, sure, sure. All that stuff, right? But I raise you. Oh my gosh. Making a challenging thing for level 20 players, especially when you have six of them. Uh, like, what do you do? I just be number pumping. I don't know what else to do. That is also what I did for Vivio uh, too, was well, I, I like number pump. There's a very fine line between, oh, they're going to beat it in one turn or, oh, this is going to squish them. Like, mm -hmm. I, I yeah. feel like it's hard to find the balance with level 20s. Yeah, I don't know what to do. That uh, It's I, it's it's one of those two. But you could always try to be like, oh, use more utility stuff, stuff that stuns them. I have never seen people more upset than <laughs> these guys when I tell them you are now stunned or you are now paralyzed. It's always and funny. Let it be known they're at these super high levels. They're near the end. And I'm even having the courtesy to say, you get stared down by the face of God. You're paralyzed for one round. I have the kindness to say something like that instead of for eternity. And they'll be like, oh, this sucks. I hate you personally. <laughs> they... huh? I could have said it does one bajillion damage. You're dead outright forever. <laughs> You're vaporized. And they'd be like, okay, oh. I guess. <laughs> that was fun. But the <laughs> stun or paralyze or any of those? Mm -mm. Oh. I, I best have my door locked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the main perpetrator who would kill you for those effects lives with you. <laughs> Certainly is one of them. <laughs> oh. So. It's fine. Taryn didn't drown. <laughs> Yet. I don't he know. Should have had Until water we get to the final boss fight where Ares just says you just can't walk on water anymore, <laughs> dummy. <laughs> Go back in the puddle. Everyone else except you can walk on water now, and Ares makes the entire floor water. Oh, God. Go fish. <laughs> but oh. yeah, no, I mean, I haven't talked about my side of things a lot because I feel like Pertusit's ending has been a lot more polished than mine. Um, Thanks. And I haven't DM'd. I've just been a player for all three campaigns. <laughs> Which I feel also has its own merits. I And I can build off of a little bit of what Levi was talking about later. But yeah, continue, yeah. Levi. <laughs> um, but yeah, what I was going to say is very similar to Pertusit. It, it is tough when you've got a party of six to seven to five. We've numbers have bounced around for us. Uh, <laughs> players who are honestly not even when they're level 20. Honestly, when they pass like level like 15, it, it's like what do i do oh lord because every single combat they're in they're gonna like throw 14 status effects on the enemy and beat them to death in two seconds uh so you have to be like okay i gotta give it so much health so that they can't instantly merc it i gotta give it enough damage output that it can hurt them without instantly killing them i gotta make sure it's doing a damage type that can actually hurt them too 
Um, something that I did dabble with at the end of my campaign a good bit was um, intentionally giving things resistance to damage I knew they were going to have. Yeah. Um, which the players generally don't care for, understandably. Um, we love our two necromancer clerics. Pertusit. Not being able to hit anything <laughs> with necrotic energy. A rule that Pertusit has done, which I really liked and I think I might adopt, is everything has a definite vulnerability of some kind because there are certainly way too many things in D&D that don't have a vulnerability, even though that is a thing that exists for things to have. And I think like a whole, I've seen like a whole three stat blocks in my life that have vulnerability to something. Uh, but that's something I think I will adopt because then that gives uh, that makes it feel a little bit more rewarding when the enemy is resistant to necrotic damage, but you find the damage type it's vulnerable to, and then maybe you can try to do something like that. Um, uh, magical bludgeoning. What a what a <laughs> damage type to have vulnerability. Good luck um, explaining that lore wise. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, no, um, it is difficult uh, because not only do they have more health and higher damaging abilities, but they have all these little little knickknacks that they can use when they get into higher levels where they can do things like plane shift on a regular basis and go into the time dimension uh, and cause a series of events which leads to them triplicating i guess is the term a uh, powerful artifact that they have that happened that happened to me Whoopsie. they did that to me uh but i didn't punish them for it because i thought it was very creative so i gave them that and they did in fact do it and it was a very memorable moment but then i also had to sit back and be like now they have this <laughs> so yeah no it's like jordan said uh, like Pertusa said, it is very much just a fine, fine balancing act. And sometimes you don't quite find the middle of the balance, but there's a, there's an area that's just enough, right? You might lean a little bit too much on the ouch, oof, this hurts them side, but enough of them survive that they can revive everyone and be okay. You might lean a little too much on the ooh, they're going to wipe this encounter side, but then you can just be like, man... They were rolling really bad this entire fight. You guys got really lucky. <laughs> or vice versa. Be like, you guys were rolling really good against them. So it just happened to turn out that way. You just happened to do really well. There's little little games you can play. Going back to what Pertusa said very early on of the just lie. <laughs> if it's not outwardly hurting your players, just lie. <laughs> True. always fudge your dice rolls do not fudge your <laughs> dice rolls don't do that don't. i have not considered an enemy that just does like 1d6 plus 30 i need to do that more do that good. would be intriguing uh can we save it for the next campaign can we? <laughs> yes we will unfortunately okay. everything else is already pre-made thank goodness i Except Duo Nisus. Could... We already have been hit by the enemy that does D20s of damage. True. The? Huh. There, yeah, there have been more than one. He's done it more <laughs> than once. Oh, I thought he was implying that there was another on the way. Well, there probably is, but he's done it more than once already. If yeah. they give me the full set of seven dice, I'm gonna use them. D100 for damage. D4s. I've done it before. Yeah. He's done every die type. <laughs> I've done D3s. 50 D4s of damage. I did 10 D4s once, and after rolling it, I was like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> that was very early on. Well, not early on. That was like mid part, and I was like, I'm done with this. <laughs> the good old pretty, Caltrops. I've D4. pretty much sworn off D4s and D6s after you guys cross level 10. <laughs> <laughs> I love me a good old D4. Go ahead. Hit hit my characters. Hit my villains D4. with it. <laughs> oh, sneak attack damage if it was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know what else there is to say about ending a D&D &D campaign. 
have fun with it. Make it kind of serious, probably. Yeah. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about the character side of it, having been on the character end yeah. of it three Go times. for it. Do that. Yeah. Um, so actually, this is the first... We, we've played three 1 to 20 campaigns. However, this is the first character and first campaign that I have fully played 1 to 20. Because in our first two campaigns, there were large chunks of it that I unfortunately missed. Because of varying circumstances and uh, the panda bear and college and... All that stuff. Actually, famously, in our first campaign, my character was in purgatory for the second half of the game because I had to go to college and we didn't have access to Zoom yet because yes. the, uh, the great the plague bear. hadn't happened. <laughs> and so it's it's kind of interesting to see the difference as we've like played more and also, in my opinion, gotten better at playing. Oh, certainly. Because I think the difference between us ending a campaign as characters now versus like when we did it for vivia one vivia one the end of vivia one was still great and very like satisfying thematically but we didn't do a whole lot of individual character like epilogues other than a few select characters that had like stuff that was set up so we saw the end of ulok we saw the end of um like the royal lines their whole thing leading off into the next campaign and so we saw a little bit of that, but we didn't do like, all right, this is what you did after the curtain went down. Whereas in Vivia 2, we did a little bit more of that. Everybody kind of had their own thing and their own idea of what they were doing. And I'm very curious to see how that works out with this one. Because honestly, I'm not entirely convinced that we're all just not going to die. Maybe. Not like not like die in combat, but I'm afraid we're going to end the world. <laughs> What if it's one of those, it was purgatory the whole time? There you go. I would we never forgive up, you for two we cents. Wake up back in the no, no, it was man. all a dream. It was a dream, yeah. There, oh. This was the this was the thing that we saw at the beginning of the game that we woke up from, Levi. We have to go find the others. Uh. <laughs> That will be the third time that Pertuzit has done that to us. To this, this was campaign. just us having a prophetic dream telling us how we could win. It's just like Avengers Endgame. This is yeah. the one in what is it, 14 million or whatever like it is, that. chance that Doctor Strange was talking about, guys. Where's Thanos? <laughs> Well, and I also oh. feel like it, as characters in this one, we've had, and this partially comes from, again, me not being there for large chunks of the other campaigns since I was kind of Ashley Johnson a little bit. But like, um, I feel like we've as a whole had more complete character arcs as a complete party and as individual characters for this one. Because I love, I love the Vivia 2 characters. And I mean, we're currently rewi rewriting the Vivia 1 characters. But I feel like this one, we this was the most that we've gelled as a party and the most development that we've had together as well as individually. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I think that um, Vivio 1 was like our beginner D&D, &D, right? It was us finally playing the game. We all sat down and we're like, we're going to do it. We're going to tell an entire story that's not just us playing for three sessions and then dumping it. <laughs> like we had done several times before just that. playing in the back of the choir room during lunch and then going our separate ways yeah and then vivia 2 was us being like okay there are actual books and rules we need to look at so it was like intermediate DD. we were now actually starting to be like okay maybe we should play a little bit more by the books the rules have there are reasons that the rules are there there are reasons they matter Olympus has definitely been advanced. Like we are in the advanced stage now where all of us generally understand how the game works. And also we have played a character through all the way once or been through a campaign that was solid enough with Vivia 2 once that now we're really like, we know what we're doing. We know what we want out of this. Um, and it has allowed us to create such a great experience. Like, I think we took that party feeling from, like, the back half, not even the back half, like, the back third of Vivia 2. Because I think mm -hmm. that once we hit a certain point in Vivia 2, once we had, like, actually cemented our party composition and we didn't have the revolving door anymore, that's where we kind of hit the point yes. of, like, okay, this is the game that we're playing. Yes. And then we didn't really have that problem in Olympus as much, so we kind of were able to just keep running from there. Precisely. 
Yeah. Well, Mr. DM man, mm. do you want to have the last word? Um, I forgot to tell you guys, I forgot to set it up properly because I forgot about it myself. But that space that Typhon was in whenever you found him at that pool had sent him back in time to kill you guys at a younger level. Huh? Was that the thing at the very beginning of the campaign that said, fine, like, I'll I'll take care of them here or something? Yeah. The space we found? Remember how he came through the, the sky? Like, the... Yeah. 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 So what, he had tried to send himself back in time and it just spit it back out at us? Yeah. Where we were? Okay. Okay. That's kind of sick. That's I didn't build it up quite properly. I've forgotten. Well, I had also forgotten. That was camp. That was session like one or two. That was session one. I remember. Well, and we didn't know who it was. We all thought it was chaos. So that had been planned since the beginning. Yes. Nice. And see, audience, you get... You get relevations like this, where I didn't know that was the thing, and now I do. And I'm sitting here in complete shock, and a little bit... No, I shouldn't say that. I... Oh, but yeah. it also on multi I'm too Gardic-minded. I'm too <laughs> Gardic-minded from us playing Gardic Phone right before this. Yikes. That was a mistake to do right I... before filming the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What was that, Jordan? Mm, Pertuse it unmulti-classed me. True. Yeah. See, this is the value. Uh, young, young DMs out there, young and old alike, whoever you are. I think no matter what, it's always going to be worth it to set things up from the beginning for the end. Your players might not care. It might have no bearing on the story whatsoever. You might even forget parts like me. But try to make it as ironclad as possible, so even if you forget some parts that should be old, you can be like, aha, see, it worked anyway. Um, because then it's pretty cool. And, as I always say, my ultimate goal, uh, besides you guys having fun, for all the back half stuff, my goal is to tell a good story. So, uh, Brick, it's fun. Anyone else? <laughs> tanned up right now <laughs> wool wool or wool or wool or oh I have to end it <laughs> <laughs> I... hey we hope you enjoyed the episode you just listened to if you really like our content make sure to like subscribe and ring the bell for notifications on YouTube and look for us on Spotify if you'd like to see us continuing to do more fun projects in the future, consider supporting us on Patreon. You can find our page linked in the description above all of our other social media links. And finally, if you'd like to keep up with the zany shenanigans of our lives and check out some more skit-based content and things like that, check us out on Twitter and TikTok. Links in the description. And hey, thanks. <laughs>